through this word, I will grow. By this word, I will triumph. In this word is my future. This word is real life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That sounded great. You may be seated and turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Now, I know for a fact there are a number of people that are in need of healing today. I know that you, if you're not in need of healing, you know people who are in need of healing. The Word of God tells us that the gospel is a healing gospel, that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were sick or oppressed of the devil. We know that he demonstrated his will. And, and if you missed the midweek, it was, a, it was a tremendous revelation on the will of God. And he demonstrated his will. Jesus is the manifest will of God. What he did, what he said, is the will of God. And he went about healing. So we know that healing is the gospel. It's a gospel of healing. We also know that it did not pass away when Jesus rose from the dead. It did not pass away when the last of the apostles or the disciples passed away, but that healing continued. And that healing continues to this day simply because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we want to look at today is him being our healer. By understanding that he's our healer, not understanding or not having the false conception that maybe yes, maybe no, perhaps today, perhaps not. Maybe he'll answer this prayer, maybe he won't. Maybe it's his will, maybe it's his not. Let's understand that he is the healer. And I'm going to, we're going to go to a, several places of scripture to show what perhaps could be the issue in some lives that hinder or delay that healing from coming to pass. And we're going to start here in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, you know the story. We've read this and taught it many times. I'm just going to briefly touch something here today. Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. It's always good to be in the house of God for a service. It's always good when service time rolls around, whether it's midweek and inconvenient, uh, now, of course, I always make exception if you're working out of town, but that's not what we're talking about. But if you have nothing else going on, it's always best to be in the house of prayer at the time of prayer. That's Thursday at 7, Sunday at 9.30 in the morning. And so at the hour of prayer, a certain man who was lame from his birth was carried and laid at the gate of the temple, which is called the beautiful gate, begging from them that entered into the temple. He saw Peter and John about to go into the temple and asked for some money. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look at us. Look at us. Look at us. What did he do there? He redirected his attention. He refocused him. What would that man naturally be focused on every day of his life? He'd be focused on the people that are passing him by, focused on the fact that they are entering into the temple and that they know they should do some good deed before they speak to God. Focused on their hands. If their hand is reaching in to a pouch to pull out a coin, focused on the coin. If the coin is in their hand, holding a cup perhaps, holding something, or having a garment laid down, focused on the coins that are coming into the garment. He's focused on survival. He's focused on the only mode of survival that he knows. Healing, it's not even on his radar. He is not focused on healing. He is not focused, per se, on them as apostles. He's not, certainly, not focused on Jesus. He's focused on what he's doing. He's focused on his job. At that moment, his job is to beg. That's all he has to make a living. That's all he has to survive. And he's in a plumb spot. Peter and John want to redirect his focus. Peter and John stop and say, look at us. Don't look at our hands. Don't look at the coins. Don't look at the crowds. Look at us. Take a minute. Look at us. Refocus. Look at us. Now, I'm going to stop there and we'll come back to this in a few moments. Let's turn back in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. Go with me there. Like you, if you have your Bibles, please turn 
to Numbers chapter 21. And we're going to look at this beginning in verse 4. It's always good when we can see it with our own eyes. I may not use the same translation. I may use my own translation or paraphrase as I'm speaking it. I'm using a King James today. But it's good to see it with your own eyes. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. They journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to, to go around or compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people is much discouraged because of the way. When someone is sick, when someone is going from doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital, treatment to treatment, they can become heavy. They can become discouraged because perhaps the treatment is not, they're not responding to the treatment. Perhaps the treatment is really taking so much of the life out of them. Perhaps it doesn't seem like they're making any progress. Perhaps every doctor has a different opinion and none of them good. Your soul can be discouraged. Your soul directs your focus. Your soul directs your attention. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Now, didn't God bring them out of Egypt? Didn't God part the Red Sea? Didn't God provide these miraculous things in Egypt that would spring them out of slavery? Didn't God promise them a land? And yet, their focus was so on the issue and the problem that they spoke against God and against Moses, their leader. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? To die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. Our soul loathes this manna. I mean, even the miraculous provision of God they're now despising. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Can you pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents? And Moses prayed for the people. Now notice this. They're not praying that the serpents disappear from the world. He's saying, pray to take away the serpents. This is not what, Mo this is not what God is going to do. God is not going to remove the serpents. Just as surely as God does not remove cancer from existence, does not remove disabilities from existence, does not remove physical infirmity or weakness from existence. It still exists. What he does is remove it from those who focus on him, removes it from those who trust in him. You see, he said, they say, can you pray that he takes the serpents away? The Lord said to Moses, didn't notice he doesn't do that, make a serpent out of brass, set it on a pole, and everyone that is bitten, when he looks at the serpent, he shall live. Now, you and I know there is absolutely no zero zilch therapeutic remedy from a bronze serpent on a pole. You can have a thousand bronze serpents in your house and look at them every day. It's not going to do anything. The, ther the therapy is in obeying the word of God, obeying what God said and redirecting their focus. What were they focused on? They were focused on discouragement. They were focused on a never-ending rut, day after day. They were focused on the difficulty in their walk. They were focused on the issues of their lives. The Lord said, refocus, look somewhere else, look at something else. Moses, make this point of reference for me. And let them know that if they look at this point of reference, they will be healed. The healing comes by obedience to God. And the obedience to God is to redirect what they're looking at and look to something God says to look at. He's refocusing them away from the problem, away from the issue, away from the day to day, away from the prognosis, away from the debilitating feelings or the symptoms. Look away. Look away and look to what the Lord provides. Let's look at it. In, and by the way, I'll just finish. Moses made the serpent of brass, put it on a pole. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten anyone and he beheld the serpent, he lived. Now, what does that imply? That implies that if anyone was bitten and didn't look at the serpent, he died. It says if anyone was bitten and looked, he lived. We're implying if anyone was bitten and didn't look, he didn't live. Obedience brings life. Obedience brings miracles. 
Refocusing is a quicker way to access those miracles. Let's look at another portion of Scripture. And this is in um, 2 Kings chapter 5. So turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, this is in the ministry of Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, an honorable. He was a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So you have a, a prominent person who's afflicted with a deadly disease. The Syrians had gone out and uh, brought away captives out of the land of Israel, and one young maid waited upon Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only, if only my lord, meaning the master, meaning Naaman, was with the prophet in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. All right, and we're going to skip to verse 9. Same chapter, verse 9. And this is when... The, uh, when Naaman comes to Elisha. So Naaman comes with his horses and with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. Your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. He went away. He said, Behold, I thought surely he would come out personally to see me. I thought he would call on the name of the Lord, his God. I thought he would strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Aren't the rivers, and I don't need to name them, the rivers of Damascus better than all the water of Israel? Can't I just go home and wash there? And he turned and he went away in a rage. All right, what was Naaman's issue? What was Naaman focused on? Naaman was not focused on God. Naaman was focused on the prophet. Naaman was focused on Elisha. He didn't know Elisha, never met Elisha. But he imagined what Elisha would do. He imagined that Elisha would personally come minister to him. How many people today feel that they must somehow personally get to a particular minister in the body of Christ or they're not going to get what they want from God? Or how many people, they think that they must hear directly or see Jesus themselves or they're not going to get what they want? Elisha does not come personally to Naaman. Elisha simply sends word to Naaman what to do. Naaman's focus was on personal contact with the minister, personal contact with the prophet. His focus was on what the prophet would do. He was expecting him to come out and to call upon God. Now, of course, we are going to pray, but he was expecting something more. He was expecting a kind of a show. He was expecting something, some kind of theatrics, in the ancient world, there were great theatrics when people would call upon their gods. And we have that example when Elijah's calling down fire from heaven and the prophets of Baal are jumping up and down on altars, cutting themselves and bleeding. So we see that there was great theatrics involved in pagan religions. And so this man being steeped in pagan religion, he wants something theatrical. His focus is not on God. His focus is on man. His focus is on something that would move him emotionally, something that would stir him up emotionally. And Elijah doesn't even go out. Elijah simply says, go wash in the Jordan River seven times. Well, that seems like it's so simple. It seems like so ridiculous. So he gets really angry and he leaves. He's on his way home. He's in a rage because his focus is incorrect. He's focused on the wrong thing. And so the servant comes to him and says, if he had told you to do some difficult thing, let's look at it. His servants came in verse 13 and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some big thing, some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than wash and be clean? This servant has enough sense to refocus Naaman and refocus him away from his preconceived idea to the word that was spoken to him by the prophet. And if he just obeyed the word spoken by the prophet, he would be healed. Now the prophet said specifically seven times. Dip seven times. Not once, not twice, seven times. 
And you must picture that Naaman dipped himself six times with no change. And yet he needed to do it the seventh time. In other words, obeying the Word of God, doing the Word of God, focused on the Word of God, following the Word of God, not making our own way, not preconceived ideas, not whatever seems to be working in the body of Christ, but what does God's Word say? Focused on His Word, following His Word, not following a person, not following a ministry, not following a move, but following the Lord, walking by the Spirit, focusing on the Word of God to do it, to see it, to speak it, to read it, to internalize it, to memorize it, to meditate upon it, to live the Word of God. So Naaman goes and does just what the prophet says, and he's healed. He's completely healed. Let's go back. Well, that's before we go back, let's go to Jesus. Mark chapter 1. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Now, we know that the Word of God says that surely he hath borne our sickness and carried our disease, and by his wounds we are made whole. That's Isaiah 53. And we know in 1 Peter 2.24, Peter quotes that but puts it in the past tense because at that point it's already happened. By whose stripes ye were healed, by whose wounds ye were healed. So let's look at Jesus being the healer, focusing on our healer here. And in Mark chapter 1, look at verse 15. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And what is Jesus doing? But focusing the attention on the kingdom of God. Focusing their attention on the kingdom of God. Now, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Now, if he's talking about the kingdom of God in the earth, are we still in the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God still here? If the kingdom of God is still here, then what works in the kingdom of God hasn't stopped working. He says, the kingdom of God. Let me read it to you again. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means it's now. The kingdom of God is now. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. So what that is, is turn away from what you are doing, Turn away from what you are saying. Turn away from what you are believing and believe something else. Focus on something else. Focus on the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of destruction, the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of sickness and disease, the kingdom, kingdom of infirmity, the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of God. Focusing on the kingdom of God brings the results of the kingdom of God. And we can see that then if we go over to verse 32, same chapter. When evening was come, the sun was set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. All the city was gathered together at the door. We're talking about the door of the house where he was staying. Everybody came there from all around the city. Word went out. People were talking to people. Now, why is it that uh, when the sun was set, I believe it's uh, a Sabbath when this is taking place. And after the sun set, the Sabbath was over and people could walk from distances that they were un which was unlawful to walk during the Sabbath. You could only walk a certain distance. So after the sun is set, the, the Mark wants us to understand, and he's writing this, recording this from Peter, that when the sun was set, they brought all that were diseased, all that were possessed with devils. They, all the city was gathered at the door. He healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, cast out many devils, and allowed not the devils to speak because they knew him. He preaches the gospel, lives the gospel, and demonstrates the gospel. Jesus goes about doing good and healing all that are sick or oppressed of the devil, is what the scripture says. Just before that, they're in the synagogue. There's an unclean spirit. I wasn't going to necessarily talk about the unclean spirit because it's not specifically healing, but in, in a sense it is. The unclean spirit was in the synagogue in a person. And a person, nobody, nobody really was bothered by this person in the synagogue. But when Jesus was there, suddenly it flared up. Suddenly he became vocal, began to cause a disturbance. What happens? What would happen today, this morning, what would happen if someone suddenly caused a disturbance here? Somebody, somebody just got up and started wildly screaming or making some kind of bizarre noises. Everybody would turn and look. 
I mean, I could be up here preaching the best message I ever preached in my life, and everybody would turn and look. Diverting the attention. Diverting the attention from the word being spoken to whatever's happening. Isn't that what terrorism does? Mm -hmm. Tries to divert the attention of the world to them, to give themselves publicity, to give themselves notoriety, because terrorism is founded on demonic principles. So this guy starts screaming out in the synagogue, and Jesus, what's the first thing he says? Be quiet. Why? He wants to refocus everybody back to the word. Refocus everybody back to him. Jesus should be our focus. Now, I mentioned we're going to go back to Acts chapter 3. So after Peter and John, we don't necessarily need to turn back. After Peter and John says, look at us, what do they say? They don't say, look at us, we got it, we got it. We're, we're, we got it going on here. We're the best. We got this ministry. They say, look at us. We don't have money to give you. But what we have, what we have, we give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What do they give? Jesus. Where do they focus their attention? Past them. Not focused on them, but through them to who's in them. For greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Not focused on their ministry, not focused on their presence, but focused on the presence of God within them. And looking at the presence of God, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When we focus on Jesus, he's our healer. Not focusing on all of the things, not focusing on all of the symptoms, not focusing on all of the daily grind and the walk and the issues and the situations with home and family and uh, jobs. Those cloud our eyes, those distract us. And yes, we need to deal with those things. But when we focus on Jesus, the healer, when we look to him and he is the one, he said, even as Moses lifted the serpent on the pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He made a direct connection between himself and that serpent, meaning that if we would look beyond the pain, look beyond the hurt, look beyond the symptoms, look beyond the prognosis, and look to him as our healer and receive from him, look beyond the person praying for you, look beyond the church, look to him as the head of the church, as the foundation of the church, as the embodiment of the church. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. He is still alive. He has not died and stayed dead, but rose from the dead. And he's the same in the days of yesterday and the days of today and the days of tomorrow. He was the one healing through Elisha. He was the one healing by the serpent on the pole. He was the one healing in Galilee. And he's the one healing today. If you are in need of healing, whether it is something major or something minor, Jesus is here to heal. Jesus is here to change. Jesus is here to restore, to restore your joy, to restore your quality of life. The scripture says that the anointing is upon him to heal the brokenhearted, open the blind eyes, open the prison doors to them that are bound. His anointing is more than enough. His anointing, you might say, well, you know, there's not just not enough anointing in this ministry or that ministry. There's more than enough in Jesus. He's got what you need. He is what you need. He gives what he has. He's here where two or more are gathered in my name. I'll be with them. He's here to heal. He's here to change. He's here to deliver. He's here to give you comfort, to give you peace, to give you confidence, to give you hope. He's here to redirect you away from what might happen to what will happen when you put your faith in Him. In Jesus' name, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for all those who are in need of healing today. Think about it right now. Search your heart. Would you like to come up for prayer? Would you like to receive today? Would you like to be healed? Jesus is our healer. Jesus is our healer. Look to Him. I want to refocus your attention on Him. Look to Jesus as if you are in the wilderness. Look to the bronze serpent. Look to Jesus as He's lifted up. Look to Jesus as your healer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is our healer. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus changes us. We thank you today for the presence of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, here to heal, 
here to deliver.